Okay, our final speaker this evening is Andrew Penn, who is a psychiatric nurse practitioner and also clinical faculty at UCSF in the School of Nursing. And he's also on the steering committee for the U.S. Psychi Psychiatry and Mental Health Congress, which is a large continuing mental, uh, <laughs> mental, Yes, oh, continuing, yeah, we are a little mental, continuing education conference that takes place, and he's had the pleasure of speaking there about um, cannabis and psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, so he's reaching a population of, of um, practitioners and clinicians. That's really wonderful, and he's also a burner, and he has uh, been doing volunteer work at the Zendo, which is a harm reduction space at Burning Man, specifically oriented towards supporting people to work through difficult um, psychedelic experiences. So let's welcome Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, we can do 30, 40, and then we'll work it out. So. Okay, sounds good. It's always risky being right after the break. So you have to break up the party to start your talk again. So thanks for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak, Natalie, and to the other folks with Erie, Julie, and Larry. Um, it, when, uh, when Natalie asked me if I would do this talk, I said, what do you want me to talk on? And she said, whatever you're passionate about. And um, I, you know, I thought, you, yeah, we just met. So um, that could be a really long conversation. But I wanted to, so I decided I was gonna narrow it down. Um, I was gonna narrow it down to, what the heck is it that makes, that accounts for this enormous change that we see in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy? You know, what, essentially, how important is the lived experience of the drug to the change that we experience? So that's, I'm kind of cutting to the end of my, my talk right there, but I'm going to fill that in in between here in the next half hour, I hope. But I want to introduce myself just a, uh, a little bit, if you'll indulge me for a second, I, I, I know you got the basics there. Because I think sometimes how how we got to what we're doing here is kind of as interesting as, as uh, what we're doing here uh, with this kind of work. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's relevant because I, I think it, it sort of helps you understand where I sort of stand uh, in, in understanding a couple different aspects of this work. So, you know, if you ever go to continuing education conferences, you always see the standard slide of all the, uh, you, you're supposed to list all the uh, drug companies you're in bed with, and I, I'm not with any, so, um, but I have plenty of internal conflicts so to declare. Doing, um, some sort of screen thing, so I don't know if that's, if it's coming off, if we can maybe... Oh, the vibration? Your screen, your screen, is that at the end of your screen? Yeah, no, it's, uh, hmm, I don't know what we can do about that. Um, so it's, only off the it's yeah, it's only just cutting off a little bit. So you'll have to guess what the last part of my sentences are. <laughs> it's like speaking Cuban Spanish. Right? Um, so I wear a few different hats, as as Natalie said. Um, I have this. I'm a Western trained allopathic uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner. Okay, so I treat patients all day long with drugs you've probably heard of, like Prozac. Okay, and things that you've heard of, like psychotherapy, right? Um, I also have this, this good fortune of being involved in this conference, which is the second largest after the American Psychiatric Association uh, meeting, continuing education meeting of psychiatric professionals. We meet every year. And I've been a, on the steering committee for this, this conference, which puts me in contact with some really amazingly brilliant people and also gives me a little bit of a bully pulpit. And so I've been able to use that to get people like Michael Mithoffer and Dave Nichols to come and speak. And I gave a talk to about 400 people this last fall about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And this is to mainstream workaday shrinks, okay, who probably have only read about it in the New York Times. Um, but I've been interested in the uh, in psychedelics since I read The Doors of Perception when I was 15, as probably some of you did too. Um, I, I've, I have a patient who is one of the subjects in the MDMA PTSD trials. Uh, I've been a burner, as, as uh, Natalie said, for the last 17 years. Um, and I've been working with Zendo for the last couple of years. So I, I find myself in this interesting position of being both kind of a believer and a skeptic. Um, and it, it, so being with, involved in very mainstream psychiatry gives me a, a good opportunity to understand how mainstream psychiatry thinks and what their inherent biases are and what their skepticism is around psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. I also understand how this tribe thinks, at least I like to think I do, and where some of the uh, limitations of that thinking may come from. So, um, so I, I used to joke sometimes that living in these two worlds makes me kind of a double agent. 
And then I realized that I was making some of my friends uncomfortable with that term. Um, so I've, I've sw shifted now over to interpreter or translator. So that those are the two worlds that I kind of sit between. So I may f you may find me contradicting myself today, which reminds me of this great quote from Walt Whitman, which unfortunately the formatting is screwed up here, but it says, do I contradict myself? I contradict, very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. And if anything I've learned from psychedelics is to appreciate paradox. So I hope you'll, you'll bear with me if I contradict myself tonight a little bit. So I think I'm preaching to the choir to tell all of you that there's research going on around the world with various psychedelics, primarily psilocybin, uh, ayahuasca, and MDMA in various places around the world uh, for a, a myriad of conditions, a very diverse group of conditions. If we had more time, we could probably talk about what sort of ties these things together, but things like anxiety and depression at the end of life, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, depression, substance dependence. So it's this really curious collection of clinical conditions which are under study for uh, treatment with different psychedelics. And as you know, this has gotten a lot of press in the popular media. There's probably a hundred articles written in the popular media for every one scientific article that's published in this area. So there's a lot of interest out there. I'm sure many of you read Michael Pollan's fantastic uh, story in The New Yorker earlier this spring. And so I went to the Horizons Psychedelics uh, Conference. Maybe some of you were there in New York uh, this last fall. And I'm sitting in, in the audience, and some of the um, some of the freshest research that hasn't even been published yet, but is already is it's in press, uh, was being presented from the NYU group that's studying psilocybin at the end of life, and they're putting up um, they're putting up numbers, they're putting up effect sizes, and any of those of you who work in, in clinical medicine or involved or familiar with statistics may be familiar with this thing in the red box here, the Cohen's D. And not to belabor this too much, but it's worth it just to make a point here that so a Cohen's D is a measurement of effect size. It's a way of saying how much impact did this thing that we did have on the outcome. And the convention is that anything under a 0.4 is considered a small effect, 0.4 to 0.7 is a medium effect, and over, over 7 is considered a large effect. And if you get an antidepressant trial which scores a 0.5, that's fantastic, okay? So just to put this in, in context, I know you can't read this from where you're sitting. On the very left, uh, the first two on the left here are antidepressants for mild and moderate depression. Really, antidepressants only become m modestly effective when somebody has very severe depression. And even then, they're not that great. They're okay. I mean, I prescribe them every day, so I must believe somewhat in them. But they're not fantastic, right? Ketamine, for example, comes in at about 0.7. So pretty impressive. I mean, definitely, uh, I'm going to take questions at the end. Treatment-resistant depression. Sorry, thanks for uh, clarifying my jargon. What is the x-axis? Uh, the x-axis? The, uh, I'm just looking at different treatment sizes here. So we're looking at Cohen's D effect sizes. So MDMA uh, for PTSD, it's hovering around 1. So pretty, pretty good. Okay. But this is the stuff that was being presented at, at, at Horizons. Psilocybin for depression. This was a, on a small, open label. A lot of problems with the methodology, but just a great, like, testing the waters kind of study that Robin Carhart Harris and his group in London uh, did. 3.2. Uh, and the NYU group is showing de depression effect sizes around 4. And I'm geeking out on this. I'm, like, n nudging the, my friend next to me. I'm like, it, it's a 4. Did you see this? And he's like, I don't, I'm not sure why you're all excited. But I'm like, it's a 4. So this is a really big deal, is what I'm trying to say. That's, that's really all that matters. Like, this is really impressive stuff. If this holds up in larger trials, these are serious game changers, OK? So psychedelics have this really interesting pathway of change that's different than how we operate with other drugs in psychiatry. So with, all these, with most of these conditions, depression may be an exception, OCD may, may be an exception. But with PTSD, substance dependence, and end of life, depression, and anxiety, something's got to happen to you before you can get any of those conditions. You're not born with them. I mean, arguably, we're all going to die. So the, the death one is kind of faded. But you can't get PTSD without a trauma, and you can't get substance dependence unless you start using a substance. So something's got to happen to you. That, that event, or those events, cause these changes in the brain. And there's some really fascinating research coming out of London. Again, Robin Carhart Harris, who is a big hero of mine, uh, is doing some amazing work with fMRI scanning and looking at rigidity of neural networks. 
But essentially, think about this metaphor that the person's way of thinking becomes very rigid, okay, very fixed. And there's something about this psychotherapy process with, assisted with psychedelics which causes this change to occur. Okay, now contrast this to conventional psychopharmacology. So in conventional psychopharmacology, you got somebody who has, who's suffering, they have an ailment. We give them a drug, which is called Prozac, I'm picking on Prozac tonight. Then something happens inside the black box of the brain. And we have a lot of speculation, you know, we increase serotonin levels at the synapse. Andrew did a really nice job of illustrating how some of that stuff works. But really, we don't really know, okay? I mean, we know some of it, but we can't give, nobody can give you a, an, a totally satisfying answer. But at the end of the day, something comes out the other side of the black box, the result. Okay, this is, this is what we think about with conventional treatment. And when was the last time anybody told you about their mystical transformative experience of being on an antidepressant? They probably didn't. I mean, I've had, I mean, now to be fair, I've had some people tell me, oh my God, this is absolutely life-changing. You know, I've been suffering with depression for 20 years. I never knew I could actually feel normal, and I feel normal. Thank you so much. So I don't want to poo-poo Western medicine, because it's really easy to make straw men. Um, one of the things that I think we like to do in the psychedelics world is make straw men. You know, big pharma. Like, you know, nobody wants, nobody wants you to have these drugs because they want you to take these drugs instead. I'm not sure I totally buy that, because, I mean, we're talking about a pretty small share of the market here. But that notwithstanding, the point is, is that, you know, these can be helpful drugs, too but they're just not as interesting as the ones we're talking about tonight. So we have this basic schematic of this, this, this therapy that, that occurs with the help of psychedelics. I think about this as having sort of three parts. There's a neurobiological part. Oh boy. You know, I think the, it keeps trying to jump on the Wi-Fi here. And that is causing some problem. Let's see if I get my... That was me when I was 19 in Death Valley. I found a grave. And my friend photographed me, photographing it. All right, let's hope that doesn't happen again. Um, so, so something happens on the spiritual level. As Tony Bosses from the NYU group said in the, in the New York article, he says, you know, I, talking about what happens on a spiritual level with psychedelics, that's above my pay grade. I don't even begin to understand how that works. So I'm not gonna comment about that, but I do wanna acknowledge that it's there um, and then Finally, oh, technology. <laughs> so much for suspense. There's this story, this subjective experience that happens. And I think most of us, when we think about psychedelics, we're thinking about the story or the subjective uh, experience. And then something happens and we get better. Okay, so there's a synthesis of these three elements that occurs in a, in a pro-healing kind of way. Um, so, I imagine many of you have heard of the idea of the hero's journey. Um, I think a video sometimes can explain things much better than I can in a shorter period of time. So if this is gonna behave, I'm going to play this for you. This is like the kind of thing that presenters have nightmares about. You know, you get up and you're like, your computer doesn't work. Let's see. My question is, do we get sound out of this? Yeah? Can any of you hear anything? No. No sound. What do Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo all have in common with the heroes of ancient myths? What if I told you they are all variants of the same hero? Do you believe that? Joseph Campbell did. He studied myths from all over the world and published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, retelling dozens of stories and explaining how each represents the monomyth or hero's journey. So what is the hero's journey? Think of it as a cycle. The journey begins and ends in the hero's ordinary world, but the quest passes through an unfamiliar, special world. Along the way, there are some key events. Think about your favorite book or movie. Does it follow this pattern? Or your last psychedelic experience. Status quo. That's where we start. One o'clock. Call to adventure. The hero receives a mysterious message. An invitation? A challenge? Two o'clock. Assistance. The hero needs some help. 
Probably from someone older, wiser. Three o'clock, departure. The hero crosses the threshold from his normal, safe home and enters the special world and adventure. We're not in Kansas anymore. Four o'clock, trials. Being a hero is hard work. Our hero solves a riddle, slays a monster, escapes from a trap. Five o'clock, approach. It's time to face the biggest ordeal, the hero's worst fear. Six o'clock, crisis. This is the hero's darkest hour. He faces death and possibly even dies, only to be reborn. Seven o'clock, treasure. As a result, the hero claims some treasure, special recognition, or power. Eight o'clock, result. This can vary between stories. Do the monsters bow down before the hero, or do they chase him as he flees from a special world? Nine o'clock, return. After all that adventure, the hero returns to his ordinary world. Ten o'clock, new life. This quest has changed the hero. He has outgrown his old life. Eleven o'clock, resolution. All the tangled plot lines get straightened out. Twelve o'clock, status quo, but upgraded to a new level. Nothing is quite the same once you're a hero. Many popular books and movies. So, if you apply this to many stories that we hear about psychedelics, or perhaps maybe your own experiences, you know, there's this archetype, this idea. That, I mean, what do we call a psychedelic experience? We call it a trip, right? I mean, that implies a journey. We talk about journeys. And this model of going from your everyday world into this underworld, this different world, battling demons, usually internal ones, and coming out the other side better and changed is really the archetype of the psychedelic experience. Um, you know, that psychedelic experience has been written about more times than I can count. And, and these, these, unifying ideas of this there's this uh, there's something about it that is different than the everyday world there's a sense of unity there's a sense of transcendence and yet you oh, this is going to make me crazy and yet you can't really explain it because it's ineffable you know um, the psilocybin study out of london one of the subjects in the quantitative qualitative study said it's difficult to find words to describe it you really need to be a poet which I couldn't, I couldn't agree with more. And if you look at these different quantitative, qualitative sub studies from different uh, studies, you'll see this, this theme emerge. Um, this is from uh, the LSD at end of life in Switzerland study. The first trip was a panic trip with almost pure fear of death. It was agony. I really had the feeling that I am dying. It was total exhaustion, not seeing an ex exit, no escape. That was a big part of the trip for me until it finally led to relaxation. goes on to say, during the second trip, the dark side also showed up at the beginning, but for a rather short time. I was a little tensed, sweating, not for long, and suddenly a phase of relaxation came, completely detached. It became bright. Everything was light. It became a pleasant feeling, a warm feeling, no pain, almost a little floating, clear, and being carried to all together with, uh, being carried together with the music. It was really gorgeous. The key experience is when you get from dark to light, from tension to total relaxation. From uh, Tom Schroeder's book, Acid Trip, where he talks about the MDMA work in Charleston, says, suddenly I found myself as both the warrior and the sage. I visualized myself at the cave where the dragon and the dungeon had been, and there I saw a stone staircase leading to a platform poised precariously above an abyss. Still engaged in my vision, I walked through the grand gate into a courtyard. I saw a golden door with rune-like symbols carved in it and around the indented outline of a human being, human figure. I pressed myself up against the indentation, just kind of floating in this place of peace and started asking questions for myself and got the clarity I was looking for. It was like my higher self told me that I had visualized the beings to look that way because I was afraid and that I could see it another way if I chose to. Then this voice came to me and said, now you know how to get here. And that made me feel so good. I am too hard on myself. I should stop worrying about what sounds weird or not. I'm not that little kid anymore who needs people to accept him. Or from the psilocybin studies in the ark. From here on, love was the only consideration. It was and is the only purpose. Love seemed to emanate from a single point of light, and it vibrated. No sensation, no image of beauty. Nothing during my time on earth has felt as 
pure and joyful and glorious as the height of this journey. Or as Jeff Gus, who's one of the investigators there in New York said, they fear death less and they love life more, which I couldn't think of a better summation right there. Uh, another subject in Charleston said, it was like PTSD changed my brain and MDMA changed it back. But what is actually happening inside the brain? So if we take a drug like psilocybin, um, as Andrew did a really nice job of pointing out, this is a drug that, it's a pro-drug, it turns into, it's, it's broken down into something called psilocin, which as you notice, ah, darn it, that red box is kind of cutting off my uh, molecule of, of serotonin there, but it, it's a very uh, close re resemblance to serotonin. And not surprisingly, it plugs into some of these same serotonin receptors that serotonin does. Um, and probably the most important one is a serotonin 2A receptor. And we know this because there's a drug called cantanserin. Cantanserin is a blocker, it's an antagonist of the serotonin 2A receptor. If you give somebody cantanserin before you give them psilocybin, they don't have a psychedelic experience. So we know that's a vital part of the process. And we're starting to understand that there's things that are happening within the networks of the brain. Um, this brilliant work that's coming out of London. I just can't say enough good things about it. If you want to read a phenomenal paper, um, Robin Carhart Harris's paper from uh, 2012, I think, in Frontiers of Neuroscience, is just absolutely brilliant, brilliant work. Hard work to read, but brilliant. Um, and essentially these changes in the way that the brain talks to itself and a loosening of the way that the brain communicates with itself. So we're starting to get at least sort of a 30,000 foot view of what's happening in the brain. Um, this, this has to be one of the most beautiful things that I've seen in a scientific journal in a long time. So on the, on the left is your placebo. This is a sort of a, a schematic of, of connection within the brain. And the, so what psilocybin is doing is it's causing the brain to talk to different parts of itself in ways that it doesn't normally talk to itself. It's kind of rerouting the traffic. It's like if you wanted to get to um, if you wanted to get to Des Moines from here, you'd probably have to go through Chicago. But if I took Chicago out of the picture, you'd have to get there a different way. And that's sort of what psilocybin does. It reroutes information throughout the brain. So you get these weird. I think this is just going to be my uh, my my task today. Um, I be I beg your forbearance here. Um, I can. Let me do that. Let's do that, but then I gotta jump out of this view. So bear with me one second here. I'm in presenter view. Everyone, all the cool kids use uh, use Prezi now, and I'm using this really. Give me one sec, guys. Sorry. What's that? Oh geez, I'm an OG. I'm getting I'm fire up my my PowerPoint here. OG, I'm not an OG yet. Jeez, I've only been in this field for 20 years. That's nothing compared to some of the people in this movement. All right. Thank you for your patience, you guys. Wi-Fi is off. Let's see if it stops doing that. All right. Hey, there we go. Um, so. But what is it that, how do we account for these really profound um, anxiolytic antidepressant effects? Well, you know what, the reality is we don't really know. We don't. I mean, we know this process happens here, but what if we, so what if we just take out spirituality and subjective story here, okay? And we just focus on neurobiology. So I'm gonna shift to a different drug, one that we do know something more about, and that's ketamine. So ketamine is this interesting drug. It's this old drug, it's, it's, you know, it's 45 years old now, almost 50 years old. Um, it has this, diso it's an anesthetic. It's a dissociative anesthetic, um, but it has this sort of pseudo-psychedelic effect. And I call it pseudo because, you know, classical psychedelic works on the serotonin 2A receptor, but blah, 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 you know, I don't want to geek out about that, but this doesn't work on that. This works on the glutamate receptor, NMDA, and methyl D-aspartate uh, uh, receptor, um, but it has these, uh, these sort of psychedelic-like effects very much based on dose. If you give a large dose of this, people will become unconscious. That's why it's used in anesthesia. Um, if you use low doses of it, it has this sort of brief antidepressant effect. Um, and medium doses have this kind of hypnotic, spacey, dissociative, pseudo-psychedelic effect. 
And um, for those of you who are interested, you can kind of see a comparison of the different, different doses there. Um, and what we do know about this drug is it has this really phenomenal antidepressant effect. Um, and I'll tell you, th this is what I wish my, most of my drugs that I prescribe do, because within, um, within a few hours of being injected with this drug, people have this huge drop in depression scores. So that bottom line is the, is the active group. The top line is the, is the placebo group uh, on a scale of, a standardized scale of depression. And you can see within a few hours, they really start to separate out considerably. Um, and you know, when you show this to cynical people, they say, well, yeah, of course they felt not depressed. You just got them high, right? And so, um, so the, the and, and you can say, no, that's not true, because if you look at these scales of intoxication and dissociation, they peak at about, not surprisingly, 20 to 40 minutes into the infusion and are pretty much gone after about an hour. Not surprising, okay? But the antidepressant effect doesn't take place for several hours later, several days later, okay? Now here's the, now you're like, why aren't we using this every day, all right? Then here's the downside. Now this is a little hard to read, but essentially you've got here the day of treatment and then about a week out. So black line is your, is your uh, that's your active group. Gray line is the placebo group. So you get this robust response that is over in about a week. Sometimes it's over in as little as three days. Sometimes you can eke it out to maybe 14 days, but it doesn't last very long. Now ketamine is a very complicated drug. It does a lot of different things, and I'm putting this up here just to terrify you. Um, but what this is, is sort of mapping out is all these different mechanisms of action in this drug. But here's the bottom line for what ketamine is doing is ketamine, so this is a rat neuron, this is a dendrite, kind of like what, uh, like what Andrew was showing. This is where, this is the branches of the trees, right? And those little green uh, baubles on the end of that red line, those are the leaves, okay? That's the, what we call branching of dendrites. So this is the control nerve. When you give this rat ketamine, this is what happens very shortly thereafter. So it's like fertilizer for that neuron. So we create this very rapid um, neurogenic uh, process that occurs here within a few hours. Okay. Now I could really have some terrifying fun here, but I'm going to spare you this. So what this is, is this kind of a schematic of a glu glutamate neuron. So glutamate, um, as Andrew pointed out, doesn't get a lot of credit. Everyone's like, oh, sexy serotonin and dopamine and all that, right? Those are tiny amounts of the brain. Glutamate's where it's at. So glutamate is a major excitatory neuron in the brain, or sorry, neurotransmitter in the brain. And it is released by these glutaminergic neurons and finds its home on these three receptors on the other side. And I want to draw your attention to the middle one, the NMDA, and methyl diaspartate. That's another word for glutamate, you know, because medicine and science is all about taking a five cent word and making it into a 50 cent word that most people can't remember. Um, that makes, that's how we look really smart. Um, but now the NMDA receptor is really critical in this, and I'm just going to give you a quick rundown. I mean, I could really do like half an hour just on ketamine uh, psychopharmacology, but I didn't want to put you all to sleep at this at late hour on a Friday. But essentially, what you've got here, so this, this NMDA receptor, it plugs into the skin of the postsynaptic neuron. It's, it's the socket, if you will, for the plug. Okay. And it sits there like a tube. Okay. And there's two, there's like two locks that have to be, remember in like those old um, nuclear war movies, there was always like two keys that had to be turned simultaneously to launch the missiles. Okay. It's kind of like that. You've got to have, you've got to have glutamate and you've got to have glycine. They've got to plug in at the same time. And right there on that manhole cover is a plug of, of magnesium. So what's got to happen is those two things have to plug in and then the neighboring area of the, the membrane of the neuron has to depolarize. So there has to be this electrical charge that happens. So when that's plugged in, that electrical charge happens, this calcium that's waiting outside, these positively charged calcium ions can flow into that tube, boom, okay, cause the cell to depolarize, okay. Enter ketamine. So in that tube, there's a little receptor area called the PCP site. PCP stands for phenylcyclidine. It is a drug that's very similar in structure to ketamine. It happens to be that's where ketamine plugs in. So when ketamine plugs into that little site in the tube, now, Calcium can't flow in, the cell doesn't depolarize, or at least that area of the, the cell doesn't depolarize. So why does that matter? So here's what happens downstream. So you all have heard of like the chemical imbalance th theory of, of depression, right? It's total nonsense, right? And here's why it's nonsense, because 
I can give I can give you Prozac right now, and tomorrow you'll have more serotonin at your synapse, at this gap between the nerves, but you're still depressed. Why? Because downstream effects have to happen. Okay, I won't go into that what those are with SSRIs, but with ketamine, once you block that receptor, you get an increase in something called mTOR. mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. And remember that word rapamycin, because that's going to matter in a minute. So this, it's like a switch. It's a kinase. So it's a switch that turns on and gets other things going in motion. What it does is it causes these synaptic growth factors to start to phospholo phosphorylatize, right? So they start growing. And the bottom line is you get this. You get more growth, you get more serotonin, you get an antidepressant effect. How do we know this? Well, remember that thing called mammalian target of rapamycin? So it's called that because there's a drug called rapamycin, which targets that target, okay? So if you give rapamycin before you give ketamine, this is in animal models, it hasn't been done in a person yet, I wanna see it done in a person. Um, what happens is you don't get this, and you don't get this, and you don't get this, and you don't get this. Now, I don't know what causes the dissociative pseudopsychedelic effects of ketamine, but wouldn't it be really interesting if we give rapamycin to people before we give them, to a depressed person, before we give them ketamine, and then we see what happens. Because what happens if they stay depressed because we've blocked this pathway, but they trip balls, right? So what if the trip and the biologic effect actually don't have anything to do with each other? That's where, yeah, right? So, so you get, so ketamine essentially is like this rapid nerve fertilizer, as if you really had to just sum it up in a, in a, in a, in a line, that's a way to think about it, okay? So with this sort of, this, this synthesis of things that happen, so I've talked about the biology part here, but most of the time when people talk about the healing that happens with psychedelics, you hear about the story. You hear about the journey. You hear about the hero's journey. If you hear about, if you read that story in The New Yorker about people going through psilocybin uh, treatment for their depression, their anxiety, when they've, they're full of cancer, and you've got, there's, this, there's a documentary that's being put together. There's this great little old New Yorker lady who says, you know, she's like, I went into my body and I saw the, and I saw the tumor and I said, fuck you, cancer, you're not eating me alive. And she's like 80 years old, I love it, you know, and I mean that great New York, like, you know, you don't fuck with me kind of voice, right? And it's like, wow, who, how can you not get behind like that kind of heroic narrative, right? I mean, what's not to love about that, right? But here's where I want to be a little bit of a fly in the ointment tonight. What if it doesn't matter? What if this story that we love so much doesn't matter? So here's where I got this idea. I was kicking her, I was, so... You may not have heard of Chuck Raison yet, but you will. So Chuck is a friend of mine. He's, uh, we're on the steering committee of that conference together. He's a brilliant psychiatrist, serious outside the box thinker, uh, interested in gut microbiomes and how that affects inflammation, how that affects depression. Check him out. But he and I were kicking us around and he said, what if you gave people, you have the whole, do the whole, you know, everything else is the same, except when it comes time to do the, the psilocybin part, have one group have it entirely under general anesthesia. And I thought, oh shit, that's a game changer. That's a serious game changer. And I kind of hope you're wrong. I really want that to fail because I kind of like the story, right? I feel kind of precious about the story too, but what if it didn't matter? And then I got thinking about this whole idea of like, mechanism versus vitalism. And this is an old scientific idea, right? But mechanism says, you know, the brain is just a bunch of parts and a bunch of really, really complicated machine, but pretty much everything in your experience, you can explain if you know enough and if you can observe enough, if you have the right ability to observe what's happening and, we're all, and we don't really have that capacity yet. We're just starting to understand the brain, but you could, distill this down, you can figure out what's happening in the brain. Okay, that's Western medicine. That's, that's sort of determinism, right? That's how we talk about the body in Western medicine. It's a machine. It's a very complicated machine. But wh what do we talk about in the psychedelics world? We talk about spirit. We talk about soul. We talk about the journey. That's vitalism. I, you can't put a spirit in a beaker 
Okay, I can't see your soul on your MRI. Okay, so you either kind of believe it's there or, you, or you're a skeptic and you say, show it to me, All right? So we have a kind of a vitalistic model and that at the core of that vitalism is the story of the psychedelic change process. Um, but it's a, it can be a little vague, right? Something happened, it was transformative. What was it? I don't know. It's ineffable, right? But what if it didn't matter? That's, what, that's the part that I'm kind of fascinated by. What if the trip that we think is the core of the experience is just a side effect of the drug? And really, what if it turns out psilocybin is this like phenomenal brain fertilizer? And you take psilocybin and you get this huge growth that goes on and that's what causes the antidepressant effect. And you don't have to be awake to feel it. You're gonna get the same result whether you're asleep for eight hours or not. What if that's the case? I mean, that's a kind of a provocative question, right? Um, I mean, how would this change the way we're talking about this, right? So, one of the things I think it would change is, one of the things I'm excited about this whole model of psychiatric assisted psychotherapy is I think it has the potential to bring back together this sort of holistic view of medicine and health and this mechanistic model because there is a biological effect happening. Clearly, these are potent biological uh, compounds. Um, and there's also something really kind of phenomenal that's happening. Um, but I think it, this sort of calls upon us to sort of not do it, you know, Tara Bratch, the, the Buddhist teacher, she talks about this idea, of, uh, and this too. You know, not, not either or, but and this too. So what if this, uh, Julie and I had lunch yesterday and we were talking about the shadow aspects of psychedelic movement. What, what are the things that we disavow? What are the things that we deprivilege in the psychedelics movement? The pharma industry, Western medicine, regular psychiatry, right? It's all hokum, right? Um, but that's stuff, you know, when you disavow something, be careful, because it'll come back and whip you in the ass. That's, if, if anyone's ever done psychotherapy, especially if you have any kind of concept of shadow, what you resist persists, right? So, I think this is fascinating because it makes us really question these things that we've, that we've just sort of taken on face value. And might this make it more accessible to people? You know, yeah, you can go to Peru and have your ayahuasca experience and that's cool. And your grandma, who's 80 years old and terrified of anything that's not her apartment, who's got ter terrible depression because she's dying of cancer, can have the healing experience of psilocybin without having the terrifying experience of ego dissolution. What if both of those could be okay? Um, and, you know, I, I, I think we would be wise as a, as a movement to really invite skepticism. You know, I think one of the smartest things Rick Doblin did when he was putting together the, the phase three trial thinking was to hire somebody who used to work for the FDA and say, what problems are we going to run into when we propose this to phase, for phase three trials to the FDA? Tell us what we're doing wrong. Tell us what we're not thinking of because, you know, the, the thing about shadow is that you don't see your shadow because you're looking at the sun. Everyone else can see your shadow. You can't. So you need to get other people to see your shadow. And so, you know, and you've all encountered this, right? You know, you've talked to skeptical friends who are like, yeah, that sounds kind of interesting, but I'm not sure I believe it, right? Well, ask them what they don't believe. You know, let's figure that out because I think if we don't ask these questions, other people sure are. I mean, it's kind of interesting. This whole thing is sort of skirted, the whole MDMA psychotherapy thing has kind of skirted below the radar. You notice like none of the like tough on drugs and crime senators have been like, you know, your tax dollars are paying for people to take ecstasy. Nobody's said that yet, but you bet they will. You better believe they will when this gets to phase three. And if we haven't thought through these things, somebody else is gonna do it for us. So that's all I got. If, um, I think we're going to do a, like a panel. Um, it's so much fun, more fun doing this talk, these kind of talks with this kind of audience than I do when I have to talk, you know, when I put my tie on and my suit and I talk to a bunch of psychiatrists. So I can put unicorns on my presentation. Um, so I think we're doing a panel. Natalie, if, you, if you're around. Yes, we out. are. Yes, there's the voice from the darkness. Yeah. <laughs> And while we're waiting for our esteemed panel to assemble, I'm happy to answer questions. I know I raced through a lot of material there. Turn, turn What's that? Oh. We lost the microphone.
Test, 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 test. Yes, in the back, sir. Thank you. Thanks. I can do, do, did you want to ask a question? Okay, cool. I take praise, too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. John Lilly's ketamine uh, talks? Yeah, there's ketamine, yeah. You know, I, they're, I think they're on my reading list, which just keeps getting longer and longer, but now I haven't. Is he, is he the one who did ketamine um, psychedelic therapy, the KPT model? Is that who you're talking about? He was in the <laughs> okay. He was in the isolation tanks. He did work in Hawaii. He was working yeah. with dolphins. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. A recording of him talking about ketamine that's legendary. That uh, if, I would guess if you shake Google, it'll I'll fall check out. it out. Thank you. You guys must be tired. Yes, sir. It's over here, Larry. Thanks. Uh, am I understanding it correctly that you're saying that when you're under anesthetic that your story is basically gone? Like that you're not storytelling the same way? Well, that's a great question, you know. So, you know, the, the problem with, that, with that, that model or that metaphor is that it assumes that when you're under ketamine, you just, or I'm sorry, when you're under general anesthesia, the brain is just turned off. And it's not. Right, so it actually turns out that maybe general inhaled anesthesia may have some antidepressant effects as well. So that's kind of a confounder. But it, it's a, be an interesting place to start because I, you know, I mean, the, the sort of the definition of anesthesia is that you don't have any uh, declarative memory of the experience of being under anesthesia. That's kind of what makes it a general anesthetic because you don't remember it. Um, but yeah, what happens in that space is not well known. What about anesthesia awareness, which is very common? When people come to Under during a full MAC yeah, anesthesia. Yeah. No, I mean, they're, or they're, they're, they're never go away. Right. So that sort of doesn't match. Your yeah, story, no, your story. You're, you're right. I mean, there are, there are, it's kind of, I don't know if anybody's ever going to do the study. Chuck wants to do the study, and I really hope he does. I hope he figures out a way to do it. But the, the confounders that you point out are, are well taken because it's not as if, you know, when somebody's in, under anesthesia, we just unplug the, the brain for eight hours. I mean, you, you're pretty negative about ketamine. No, no, I, 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 I wish it lasted longer. That's, that's what I, I, well, that, no, I just I wish mean, the antidepressant effect. As a psychedelic experience. I, I don't know if I'd say I'm negative about it, but, but say more. Pseudo. <laughs> I call it pseudo, you know, here's why I called it pseudo. And I, because, <laughs> because, you know, we, we love to split hairs in, in the psychedelics world. And so I've heard people say, oh, it's not a classical psychedelic because it wor doesn't work in the serotonin to a system, and I heard you know Phil Wolfson in an interview the other day say you know classical. I mean these things have been written. These things that you know Hoffman synthesized LSD in 1943. It's not like we're talking about something that's thousands of years old. I mean obviously with plant medicine we are, but um, yeah, I, I'm using the term pseudo, which is not meant to be pejorative, but just to distinguish it from serotonergic. I should probably say non-serotonergic psychedelic. <laughs> yes, I had a, a comment. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to posit that. Ayahuasca medicine does involve the whole context of spiritual, mystical, ritual as part of the healing. I mean, when you, when you really get into that world, that, that's what it's all about. There's no question that just pharmacologically it has beneficial effects on the body and that's being explored and, and understood. But the, the ceremonies are very much that mm -hmm. it's the full package, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I, th I and, think you're... And then, and then when they're used to treat addictions, mm -hmm. that's kind of the claim that it's more than just, you know, a pharmacological agent yeah. that is going to suppress the addiction uh, behavior and, you know... <clears throat> the withdrawal effects and so on and so on, but but the, there's this whole other context. That, that yeah, I think you're making a great point, which is that um, you know we in Western medicine, Western science, like to isolate. Uh, you know, we want to figure out what is the what's the magic ingredient, and then take it and decontextualize it, and and take it out of, out of you know and use it, and think that we can use it only in that setting. And and I think you're right. I think that's problematic. And I think. The use of these things uh, in in cultures for a lot longer than 1943 points that out. 
challenges that we are in a Western, you know, what's the, what's the religion of, of 2015? Science, right? So that's, you know, those are the gods we have to satisfy. Um, but I agree there are, there are other gods. Um, also another thing with the Ibogaine, I think there's a nor Ibogaine, right, that isn't actually active. It just works in at a very low dose, sub-threshold dose, and actually still works for healing the addiction or, or curbing the addiction as a, an addiction interrupter. I am going to guess that there are people that have buckets more information about Ibogaine in this room than I do. So I'm not even going to venture a guess on that answer, on that question. Yeah, let's, um, let's give Andrew a round of applause, please. <laughs>